So how can I get investment exposure to wine, maybe even just a taste of investing in it? Well, there are generally three ways. The first is a very broad approach, purchasing shares of big booze companies to get general exposure to wine. I think Anheuser-Busch, Constellation and Brown and Foreman. Once you look closer at those companies, you'll see they aren't businesses specializing in just beer or whiskey. Take Constellation Brands, for example. Corona beer comes to my mind, but I don't think of wine. Someone else might know Constellation for their stable of wine brands. Another investor might think of Constellation as an indirect way to own a piece of canopy growth the cannabis company. The point I'm making is that players like Constellation or an LVMH, for example, are broad strokes. They're not precision plays on wine investment, but they do have their own wine interest. That's an easy and broad approach to investing in wine buy big alcohol. A second approach is more pointed and we'll use a service like VinoVest to buy into a fund of individual bottles of wine. Nothing about it is traded through your brokerage or an exchange. Instead, the premise is that VinoVest takes custody of expensive wines that they think will appreciate in value and they store and insure the bottles on your behalf. The assets you deposit into VinoVest get allocated to a variety of different bottles from different regions. That's their form of asset diversification. You're probably thinking I'm hyping up this company to get you to invest in it like oh so many YouTubers. Nope, here's the killer. Why this isn't the investment vehicle you want for wine exposure. The fees are brutal. Nobody is surprised by this. The cuter and fancier you get with your investing, the higher the fees are, it's always the case. VinoVest wants 2.85% annual fee from you. It better grossly outperform the S&P 500 because fees like this are going to kill your growth potential. So recapping so far, approach number one to investing in wine is using a broad stroke to buy alcohol companies that have some access to wineries within their stable of brands. Or approach number two was to invest in an index of exceptional wines, but by sloshing over hundreds in fees to a custodian in the process. Neither approach is my cup of wine. In fact, the third and best way to get wine investments into your portfolio is by carefully examining the pure play wineries that are publicly traded. There's a few of them to choose from, and I think pure play wine businesses are the best way to profit from the 400 million cases of wine being consumed in the US each year. If you're going down this route right off the bat, you need to keep an eye on two things. Where is the company domiciled and how small is their market cap? Many of the publicly traded wineries are traded on overseas exchanges, or you're dealing with ADRs or they're over the counter an opportunity for things to go wrong. And regarding market cap, I have grocery bills bigger than the cap of some of these companies. An example, Scheid Vineyards, 13 million bucks for market cap. It's crazy small. If you like to live on the wild side and are naturally inclined to do the opposite of everything I say, I've got two American wineries for you to look at. I'm not personally investing in these. The first is Crimson Wine Group, ticker CWGL. It's both OTC and a micro cap, but I can verify for you firsthand that their Archery Summit Pinot Noir is fantastic fantastic and expensive. Nothing better than an Oregon Pinot. Crimson has a small stable of brands and vineyards, but if you think back to my farmland REIT videos, geographic diversity is important when investing in agricultural property. Crimson Wine Group checks off that diversity box and has great wine. I'm giving this company an honorable mention. Same thing with Willamette Valley Vineyards, ticker WVVI, an Oregon producer who I can't recommend for just one reason. The share price shot up 50% in a week earlier this year. Hard to say what exactly the reason for that jump was, but it coincided with a China-Australia dispute over wine tariffs. What goes up on very little news is likely to fall on very little news. So jumping into the Willamette Valley vineyards right now is maybe a little too cute and risky for me. Keep it on your radar though. Those are two of the smaller pure play wineries traded on US exchanges. Like I said, I'm not buying them, but I've got two bigger, more stable players that I like based on my research. They are Duckhorn Vineyards, ticker 
NAPA, that's Napa. Can you guess where they focus? And Vintage Wine Estates, ticker VWE. These are both pure play American wineries. They aren't trying to sell whiskey and wine or Corona and wine. The most obvious difference between these two is the retail price of their wine. VWE is focused on the rapidly growing $10 to $20 bottle range. Duckhorn is focused on the higher price points, what the company calls luxury wines. In fact, the Duckhorns S1, they show us that they have multiple bottles that could fetch over $100 a pop. That's mighty fine drinking. Let's look at both, starting with Duckhorn. Their portfolio includes 10 wineries and 800 acres of high-priced land. Two of their wines have received the coveted Wine of the Year Award from Wine Spectator, reinforcing the idea that they are a leader in the high-end segment that connoisseurs will gladly pay for. When we pop open their books, we see last quarter they reported sales were up 31% year-over-year with an EBITDA of $33 million. We can see, too, that their direct-to-consumer sales have lessened as restaurants and venues began to reopen. The company attributes their rise in sales to a 41% increase in volume, which bodes well. Not only is Duckhorn operating with great margins in this high-end wine space, but their sales are growing faster than other high-end producers. A fact that Duckhorn attributes to the scale of their operations versus their smaller competitors. Their S1 also has a five-point strategy to maintain their impressive growth. First, Keep growing sales by producing award-winning wines that build brand recognition. Second, evolving the portfolio to capture existing trends, such as the seltzer movement sweeping the country. Third, expand wholesale operations beyond their current 47,000 accounts to pierce what Nielsen estimates is 500,000 licensed retailers nationwide, all while simultaneously growing DTC capabilities and taking advantage of M&A opportunities as they materialize. So the big takeaways for Duckhorn's story is that they sell luxury wines, which is the fastest growing segment, and Duckhorn is outpacing other luxury winemakers. They're profitable, with great margins, and equipped to continue expanding at this rapid pace. But before you put in your buy order, or should I say case order, let's check out the other options. Vintage Wine Estates. I'll call them vintage going forward. First problem with vintage is that it became public via a SPAC. Now, not all SPACs are automatically overvalued, fraudulent, or shady, of course. You may have seen my deep dive into Benson Hill. It's an agri SPAC with big potential, but Duckhorn IPO'd in the traditional sense. I think that's important to keep in mind compared to vintage wine estates. Going public via the SPAC route is just a little odd, maybe a little suspect. The second biggest difference between these two wine conglomerates is their price points. Vintage is predominantly in the 10 to 20 range and Duckhorn a lot more being in the luxury wine. Funny enough, Vintage makes the same claim as Duckhorn that their price point is the fastest growing segment in the wine industry. Hmm, yes, it's strange, but I think the short of it is that both are experiencing exceptional growth. A few more interesting tidbits on Vintage. The merger was led by then Diageo CEO Paul Walsh and helped add 80 billion to the company's market cap. Next, Vintage owns almost 950 acres of prime grape growing hills and has control over another 2,000 acres through leases, allowing strong growth potential. And finally, the insider lockup doesn't end until almost 2023. Those are three strong positives. Vintage has also made over 20 acquisitions in the last decade. Very conglomerate in a rather fragmented industry. And they also have a private label brand that's in Costco, Kroger, and Target. You wanna talk about volume sales channels there. I wanna close with just a few comparisons between the two. When comparing similar businesses, I like to look at enterprise value over EBITDA to get a sense of multiples. Here, Vintage is at 42 and Duckhorn 26. Check out this graphic too. This is from the Vintage Investor Packet. I love that they included this because it saves me from having to create it from scratch. There you have it, two pure play wineries to evaluate for your portfolio, Vintage Wine Estates and Duckhorn. As an added bonus, they are quasi-agricultural. I love that as an inflationary hedge. I predict strong organic revenue growth in the coming decades for these two winemakers. People aren't drinking less wine, they're drinking more and that won't change. Thanks for stopping by. 
drink a nice glass of something with me to celebrate this analysis, and I'll see you on the next one. If you've watched the whole video, please hit that like button. It's easier than popping a cork on a bottle of wine. All right, cheers.